Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to present today six corners uh, belonging to, to CKD associated anemia. So uh, I collected six exciting issues related to anemia. So the first corner is the relationship between sodium glucose transporter to inhibitors and hemoglobin synthesis and erythropoietin release. To start with, in type 2 diabetes, there is increase in angiotensin 2 and increase in sodium glucose co-transporters. So what are the consequences? The consequences, if we have increased angiotensin 2, this means efferent arterial vasoconstriction with reduction of blood delivery and decrease, decrease oxygen supply. In the same moment, there is increased sodium reabsorption by proximal convoluted tubule with subsequent increased oxygen consumption. So we have reduced oxygen delivery and increased oxygen consumption. This creates hypoxic environment and increased hypoxia inducible factor with subsequent release of erythropoietin by fibroblast. So this is the effects of angiotensin 2. What about the situation in diabetes? In diabetes, there is increased sodium glucose co-transporters with subsequent increased glucose reabsorption by proximal converted tubule. Increased active glucose reabsorption will lead to increased uh, glucose in tubular interstitium with subsequent either directly or indirectly damaging to the cells secreting erythropoietin. Uh, so it reduces hypoxia and dismal factor. And here there is a reduction of erythropoietin. So what, if we use RASP blockade, either angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker, this will inhibit the actions of angiotensin 2 with subsequent reduction of erythropoietin. And if we use sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor, this will be associated with improvement of hypoxia and disable factor and increased erythropoietin production. So this is the concept that both uh, RASP blockade and sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors react in opposite direction. RASP blockade reduces uh, erythropoietin while sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor increases erythropoietin. And this is what was shown here in this study that included just nine diabetic patients who were enrolled and administered 100 milligram canagliflozin once daily for 12 weeks. The patients received the fixed doses of conventional and the diabetic drugs and renin angiotensin system inhibitors for eight weeks before enrollment. These drugs were continued during the study. So the aim is to assess the effect of adding sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor to uh, treatment of diabetes, including RAS blockade. What happened? Increase erythropoietin production by almost 38% with subsequent increase of erythropoiesis and hemoglobin and hematocrit. This means that sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors ameliorate the effect of RAS blockade. However, this action, it seems that it is restricted to diabetic patient because as shown in this experimental uh, model of chronic kidney disease in non-diabetic rats, so here the, uh, uh, there was no effect. Uh, so there is a failure to confirm a sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor induced hematobiotic effects in non-diabetic rats with renal anemia. The second corner is ESA and nephroprotection. The, uh, the question is, if we use the ESA, erythropoiesis stimulating agent, for patients with CKD, 
thus this use will uh, reduce the progression and retard the progression of chronic kidney disease. This is a study which is known as PREDICT. It is a randomized controlled trial, and PREDICT is abbreviation of the prevention of end stage kidney disease by darbabutin alpha in CKD patients with non diabetic kidney disease study. Estimate GFR of the patient was between 8 to 20, and the aim is to assess the treatment of anemia with darbobutene to reach very low hemoglobin target from 9 to 11 and high target hemoglobin between 11 and 13 to assess correction of anemia by darbobutene is this correction uh, reflect uh, can ref uh, does this correction reflect on uh, retarding the progression of coronary kidney disease, and unfortunately, uh, treating anemia with DARB routine to reach high target of hemoglobin was not transferred or translated into beneficial effect on the rate of progression of coronary kidney disease. There is no difference between the two arms of uh, low hemoglobin and the high hemoglobin using estrobutene stimulating agency in cancer is a challenging situation because the use of estrobutene stimulating agent may increase cancer progression and, in, and this is a very uh, problematic issue. So, uh, and I like this article. This is a review article uh, that was published in seminars in the dialysis last year showing the anemia management in cancer patients settling some principles before offering ESA therapy, conduct a history. It is a very important message. We should take good history, clinical examination, diagnostic tests before giving ESA therapy. Uh, I, am, uh, I don't like the, some prescription of my colleagues um, for patients who uh, have a prior history of stroke, cancer, and, and don't mind uh, to give a high dose of ESA therapy. So before offering ESA therapy, we should know a good history, applying a diagnostic test, uh, and to identify alternative causes of anemia, aside from chemotherapy or underlying hematobiotic malignancy because the patient may have cancer and have a specific cause for anemia. Regarding ether therapy, we shouldn't use ether therapy to patients with chemotherapy associated anemia whose cancer treatment is curative in intent. This means if we are hoping of a cure of cancer, and anemia is associated with chemotherapy, it's better to uh, be very cautious and not to uh, be in hurry to use ether therapy. ESA may be offered to patients with chemotherapy associated anemia whose cancer treatment is not curative and intent and whose hemoglobin is less than 10 gram per deciliter, and depending on the severity of anemia and the clinical circumstances. Uh, red blood cell concentrate transfusion is also an option. So we should balance the situation. So the, the benefit and the harm is a therapy may increase cancer growth and in the same moment we would like to treat anemia. So if the cancer is of curative potential, it is better to avoid ether therapy. And if it is chemotherapy associated, we can use small dose of ether therapy, uh, provided that the, uh, there is anemia, uh, hemoglobin is less than 10. ESA shouldn't be offered to patients with non-chemotherapy associated anemia. This means if cancer is the cause of anemia and we will use ether therapy, ether therapy will increase and flourish cancer. One exception is ESA may be offered to patients with lower risk myelosplastic syndrome and serum EBO level less than 500 international units per liter. For patients with multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, or chronic lymphocytic leukemia, clinicians 
should observe the hematologic response before considering an ESA therapy. And this is an important message. All ESA, ibutin beta, alpha, biosimilar ibutin alpha, are considered equivalent with regard to safety and efficacy in treating anemia in cancer patients. ACEs increase the risk of thromboembolism, and this is the most important point. Physicians must weight the risk of thromboembolism and use caution and the clinical judgment when considering ESA use. ESA may be used to target the lowest hemoglobin concentration needed to avoid blood transfusion. And ESA should be discontinued in patients who don't respond within six to eight weeks. So the rationale, when we decide to give a therapy, short course, a small dose, and assist response. If there is no response, to stop uh, ESA therapy because we are afraid of thrombogenesis and you are afraid of cancer growth. This is a very nice systematic review of randomized controlled study uh, assessing the effect of erythrobiosis stimulating agents on clinical outcomes in breast cancer patients. The, the most important result, current evidence suggests that use of ESA reduces transfusion, this is needless to say, uh, but increases mortality and risk of thromboembolic event. So the physicians should be smart in calculating the risk benefit. Hepcidin conundrum. It is the very interesting point because hepcidin is a marker of inflammation. And uh, just to uh, show the, how hepcidin interacts with anemia management, hepcidin binds ferroportin. Ferroportin is present in the intestine and in the cells and in the reticular endothelial system. When hepcidin binds ferroportin, it leads to ferroportin degradation. By ferroportin degradation, means that iron is not available for heme synthesis. So this means that there is block of the intestinal, intestinal absorption of iron and the block of release of iron from reticular endothelial system with subsequent resistance for anemia management. How to target hepcidin? There are many pathways, either direct hepcidin inhibitors, and all these are in uh, vitro and the, uh, studies, but for in vivo studies, there are here, we can use uh, uh, interleukin-6 receptor antagonist because it will uh, target inflammation and others, but for my mind, Hypoxia and disable factor stabilizers are the most important exciting clinical tool to target hepcidin. Uh, other ways, here hepcidin binds ferroportin. So if we use ferroportin antibody, this antibody will bind uh, ferroportin and block hepcidin's interaction with ferroportin. So it will protect ferroportin from degradation and leading to increased availability of iron. Other molecule, which is bone morphogenic protein sex uh, antibody, uh, that blocks uh, bone morphogenic protein from binding to its receptor, thereby reducing hepcidin mRNA transcription and hepcidin expression, allowing more iron influx. So in this slide, this, this is, are the uh, phase one studies. We may target hepcidin by uh, antibodies that bind the ferroportin, so it prevent, uh, prevents hepcidin from degrading ferroportin. Or this antibody that uh, bind to its receptor and block hepcidin release. So either to inhibit hepcidin release or to inhibit hepcidin from uh, degrading ferroportin. What about the proton bump inhibitors? Through the last five or six months, I am totally against the use of uh, or the abuse of proton bump inhibitors. Once critically indicated, we can use them, but for short period of time. Here today, I'm adding to your information that hepcidin 
there is inter inter, inter relationship between the PPI use and hepcidin. In comparison to the control, this is hepatoma cell line. The, uh, in the control, uh, this is the hepcidin uh, mRNA, relative fold change. If you, you can see clearly that the use of proton pump inhibitors are associated with increased hepcidin. So imbrazole, lanzoprazole, rabiprazole, bantoprazole, all of them are associated with increased, significant increase of hepcidin. And this is in comparison to control and to H2 receptor blocker. Another point, correlating uh, proton bump inhibitor use and anemia. This is the, the, this is the to the opposite of the stream of hepcidin as a marker of inflammation, resisting anemia management, and the barrier for successful anemia management. Here, this is an experimental murine lupus nephritis, showing that hepcidin have another phase. Uh, hepcidin treatment reduces severity and delays the onset of lupus nephritis by targeting interarenal and systemic inflammation, uh, macrophage infiltration and proliferation. So it seems that it is not only one direction, so we can find the bad bad ugly phase of hepcidin, which is anemia resistance, and this is the amelioration of kidney injury in lupus, so this is another good phase of hepcidin. Let us concentrate on anemia management by hypoxia inducible factor stabilizers. From the clinical trial last year from China, this is the randomized clinical trial uh, showing the effect of roxadostat, which is the member of hypoxia inducible factor stabilizers for patients not still not on dialysis. So these are pre-dialysis patients, <coughs> patients who have chronic kidney disease and not yet dialyzed. It is phase three trial uh, conducted in 29 sites in China. Uh, Roxadostat was used uh, for 100 patients, 100 patients, and here 51 patients in placebo arm. And the results showed clearly that uh, Roxadostat improves uh, hemoglobin and in the same moment uh, leads to significant reduction of hepcidin in comparison to placebo. So this is the advantage. Uh, Roxadostat, it is anti-hepcidin or reduce inflammation. This is for patient not yet on dialysis. What about hemodialysis patient? Another phase three trial from China, Roxadostat, a treatment for anemia in patients undergoing long-term hemodialysis, 200 patients here and 100 patients in protein alpha, the, there is significant difference, reduction of hepcidin and improving of anemia management. So for both phase three trials in uh, CKD and dialysis patients, confirming the efficacy of roxadostat. Another trial from Japan, Fifth three randomized double blind active comparator darbo alpha study of oral roxadostat in CKD patients with anemia on hemodialysis in Japan. This is a number of patients 150 here and 150 in the darbo alpha. And uh, the uh, roxadostat was not inferior to darbo alpha. What are the members? of uh, uh, hypoxia and disable factor stabilizer, uh, stabilizer. This table shows uh, many members here, uh, Dabrodostat and others. Uh, if you look at the half-life, half-life for Roxadostat is 12 hours. Uh, this is, uh, and for others, uh, other hypoxia and disable factor prolyl hydroxyl inhibitors are of shorter half-life. What is the clinical impact of this difference in half-life? Roxadostat is given three times per week. So every other day, the dose is between one to two milligram per kg, 70 to 100 milligram per dose. So this is the reflection of long half-life uh, of the Roxadostat. This is the dosage of each, each one of them. Adverse effects to both in mind, here nausea, uh, decrease in QT in, in interval, 
in roxadostat hyperkalemia i'm not surprised by hyperkalemia because uh, the shifting in metabolism to anaerobic because of hypoxia may lead to acidosis and hyperkalemia to put in mind especially for patient not yet on dialysis uh, mild here mild transient increase in serum uric acid hypoglycemia and for this member nasopharyngitis hyperkalemia and constipation uh, the effect of, on hemoglobin is manifest on the TSAT, on other parameters, ferritin, hepcidin, uh, con constant reduction of hepcidin, increasing erythropoietin, and this is how the uh, erythropoietin is increased. Uh, for example, oxidostat incre increased the erythropoietin concentration by uh, this uh, range from baseline following treatment with 100 milligram three times weekly for 24 weeks. So this is the effects, the effect on cholesterol. The most important problem is there is a fear of increasing uh, uh, gross factors, uh, vascular factors, uh, vascular and cellular gross factors. So this is why we are think the, the authors are afraid of mal theoretical uh, malignancy, but, but it is still a debatable issue. This is a very nice review article. Now this is the uh, uh, NDT, a very nice question, very ex exciting questions. Are all erythrobiosis stimulated agents created equal? If we think of the traditional ether therapies, I think, although there are some studies showing beneficial survival or mortality of one uh, of the members comparing short and uh, long acting, however, the, I think the net result is all of them are equal. Uh, so we should use which is the most available and to uh, put in consideration how to convert the dose from one member to the others. The most important point that I want to as, uh, address is the difference between the conventional ESA therapy and bromyl hydroxase inhibitors, hypoxia, and some factor stabilizers. What are the difference, uh, differences in their characteristics? Uh, conventional ether therapies are given in parenteral, and here, Brolyhydroxyzine inhibitors are oral drug as an advantage. Biological and Brolyhydroxyzine inhibitors are chemical drugs. <coughs> Sorry. Here we need a refrigerator for the conventional ether therapy. Here it is uh, in, uh, easy for, to be carried out in the ambient temperature. Increase of hemoglobin, yes. Decreased blood transfusion, yes, this is the same. Iron therapy, if we use ether therapy, this will increase the need for iron. This is the conventional, conventional ether therapy. Another advantage of the bromide inhibitors and hypoxia and this factor stabilizer is the need of both ether therapy and iron, both of them are reduced by bromide hydroxylase inhibitors. No effects of conventional ether on functional R deficiency in the inflammatory uh, environment. Here, higher mobilization of iron, so it has a positive effect on the functional R deficiency. Hepcidin level, uh, hypoxia and factor stabilizer lead to constant reduction, consistent reduction of hepcidin, consistent reduction of inflammation. Here, cholesterol, potassium, diarrhea, there is no effect of uh, conventional ether therapies, but here cholesterol is reduced, hyperkalemia may be there, and uh, diarrhea may be among the side effects of primary hydroxyzine inhibitor because they are orally given drugs. For different stages of CKD, both ether therapy and hypoxia and factor may be used, but uh, here the uh, data, uh, are lim uh, li there is a limitation of the use of um, uh, the bromohydroxyzine uh, inhibitor in kidney transplantation. Regarding the uh, CKD progression, neutral effect, here may possibly slowly, a slower uh, progression rate. Pediatric patient, yes, 
conventional ether therapies are used. Here there is no data. For diabetes, yes, it used ether therapies. Here there is a risk, possible risk for diabetic retinopathy that awaits further testing in randomized controlled studies. For uh, polycystic kidney disease, yes, we can use ether therapy. Uh, here for hypoxia and insulin factor stabilizer, possible risk of cyst progression. All cause and the cardiovascular mortality, possible increase of uh, the mortality cardiovascular by ether therapy. Uh, and the uh, uh, possible increase in higher hemoglobin at higher hemoglobin target in hyper-responsive patients. In comparison to ibutin alpha, there is a decrease of MACE, the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events in incident dialysis patient. Cancer risk, possible concern is there with ESA therapy. Also possible concern in relation to vascular and serial growth factor increased by hypoxia and insulin factor stabilizers. No demonstration till now. We need longer term data uh, to confirm the results. Balmoa hypertension, controversial. Here, there is a possible worsening by hypoxia and insulin factor stabilizer. Neutral effect on autoimmune disease by ESA therapy here. Possible worsening by prolyhose inhibitors. Inflammatory bowel disease neutral effect here, controversial effect. So it seems that there is a difference between ESA therapies and prolyl hydroxyl inhibitors. Put in mind that prolyl hydroxyl inhibitor hypoxia and dismal factor stabilizer are best fitting for inflammatory environment. Uh, although we should take everything caution because all the results are short duration and the ibuitine is present since the end of it is so to both this in mind. Regarding COVID-19, what about the using ferritin? This is a very nice, uh, because uh, ferritin is a parameter of inflammation. This is a single center study where here 268 patients know COVID, COVID negative, and 22 patients COVID positive. In comparison to the baseline, COVID positive patients had increased, significant increase of ferritin. In this center, they follow the patients by serum ferritin monthly. So this is good uh, because they follow ferritin monthly and they wisely use iron. It seems that uh, following up ferritin is, is of important value for diagnosing COVID-19 and correlated with COVID-19 as shown here. The red uh, bar here reflects the ferritin above 800 nanogram per milliliter in COVID uh, patients. Uh, to put in mind, uh, what are the causes of hyperferritinemic uh, state, states? We have uh, uh, traditional four causes of hyperferritinemic syndrome, uh, and we can add severe COVID-19 at the fifth syndrome of hyperferritinemic states. So we have severe COVID-19, septic shock, adult onset Stelzi disease, and macrophage activating syndrome, macrophage activation syndrome, and catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. If you fix this table and read here, ferritin is high, and it seems it is very high in adult uh, onset still disease and the macrophage activation, and high in uh, the rest of the situations. And this is the range of ferritin in each category, and you can fix the table to just to see the difference between uh, these syndrome, although all of them are associated with increased ferritin. What about ESA therapy use in COVID-19 patients? We have two scenarios. We have a patient who is admitted because of severe COVID and associated acute kidney injury and the anemia. In this scenario, as you see here, red color means it is risky. Risky because of increasing the risk of thrombogenesis by ether therapy for COVID patients. Second, if the patient is has if the patient has severe COVID, this means an environment of inflammation. So are waiting uh, low uh, response and in the same, same moment a risk of thrombogenicity. So it is red, and uh, according to this 
article is better to be avoided in this context. What about patients on dialysis who are treated, previously treated with either therapy? We can continue, but to be cautious, don't escalate the dose because the risk of thrombogenesis. This is why the color is here is not uh, green, it is still blue. So we should be careful. However, this is the letter to the editor uh, showing, uh, addressing uh, some beneficial effect of, of the using of erythropoietin on the inf inflammatory parameter because EPO may modulate the immunity as shown in this case, 80 years when uh, the patient has se severe COVID that was ameliorated uh, by the use of erythropoietin because erythropoietin may be associated with a reduction of nuclear factor kappa beta and a reduction of apoptosis and others uh, decrease apoptotic signals, differentiation, uh, neuroprotection and cytokine modulations. All these are beneficial effects of EPO therapy. In this case, uh, the use of EPO was associated with miraculous therapeutic, miracle therapeutic effect. So to put everything in mind, uh, again, in the environment of severe inflammation, we are, we are his, hesitant to use IVIR. We are hesitant to start the able for or ether therapy for patients until we have further evidence. And if we give ether therapy for patients who were already on ether therapy, we should be cautious and to put thrombogenicity in mind. And it seems that, again, hypoxia and this factor stabilizer may be best fitting here in the inflammatory environment, but we are in lack of evidence. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send it to my email. Thank you and goodbye.